Thank you for your introduction. Uh, you could keep on if you will, like. Uh, you're doing just great. Uh, I'm no longer in Reno, Nevada. <laughs> I lost as much money as a casino. Uh, yeah, but I'm doing the same old stuff. I'm at the Iowa State University, not the University of Iowa. This is my correct uh, email and information, and you can hear me. And so I have way too many slides, so I'm going to go very quickly. A lot of uh, what you have are, are the written components, uh, but I like pictures, so we're going to see a lot of pictures. These are the things I'd like to talk about if you'd like to. Uh, do you all know Fist to Five? Uh, what do you really care about? You raise up the number of fingers. It's a good thing for. Uh, um, building a consensus, but I thought I'd uh, move away from my own Michigas here. And uh, Doug, are you here? Okay, well, I, I, I was, he said, should we use struggle or what was the other word? I said, well, struggle's much better. I'm really into the, now, proto-Indo-European roots. Are you with me? <laughs> I'm hardly with me, but uh, the... <laughs> The STR is what I'm looking at, and really I'm looking at the STA. Like, I'm digging STA because it means to stand or to have a stake. You'd look at STA words and make the meaning connection. I know when I'm pointing, I really mean what I say. Uh, so you make the meaning connection with STA, and you'll find that a lot of them are um, standing and uh, um, uh, str and so I started to look at S T R U G, trying to make up some reason why struggle was better than that other word, uh, and you can see that. Um, sorry. Uh, um, you can see that it comes from the old Norse. It's a very old word, 14th century. It didn't get anywhere, and that's what Doug told us. It doesn't have to get anywhere. It just has to be the process of looking. And you have these websites, by the way, in your handout way later on. I'm going to do upper level later, but I thought I'd start with upper level anyway. Uh, so here's STR. Here's another website called VisiWords. And I hit ST, STR here in the middle. Um, let's see if I can get, the, it doesn't show as nicely. But you can hit any of these and it will tell you more words that fit these patterns. And uh, kids love these. These are all words related to struggle. And then I had to go into the Proto-Indo-European roots, and uh, I didn't find out much. So let's go ahead and go to my, uh, but you're teaching students how to look and think about words and how to be excited about words. Do I, can you tell my, that I'm excited? You don't know quite what about, but let's go together. So I'm going to talk about literacy development, a little bit about assessment, lesson plan format and word study routines. What is the essential work during our word study? Uh, classroom organization. I'm not going to spend much time on six. Uh, I can do that, though. I'd like to reconceptualize how we're teaching spelling. Uh, you talked about uh, do unto others as you were done to. And I'd like to, to reconceptualize how we're teaching spelling. But first, I'd like to go into why we would do that. And then I'd like to go into vocabulary instruction. And I have way too many slides, so I have a piece of paper here that tells me where to go uh, should I run out of time. Um, so here we go. We want routines in our classroom. We want to learn how to behave with each other. And uh, we also want a sense of decorum in our classroom. Let's stand together and do things together. But we also want it to be enjoyable and working with your partners. These are some of the books that we've written. Uh, this is a second edition of Vocabulary Their Way coming out. Here's Words Their Way with English Learners. This is brand new, pre-KK. And we have about 14 other, 13 other books. And this is for 4 through 12. So let's look at, the, and I'm not going to read these to you, but you, they are in our talk, and I'll be sharing them with you as we go. And so these are some of the things in word study and vocabulary that I've highlighted. Nuances, figurative language, domain-specific, general academic vocabulary. These are some specifics from the core standards. Vocabulary is embedded in phrases. Isn't that a nice one? What does it mean? Uh, mythology and biblical illusions. 
Have you thought about that recently? Why, why, is the core sta- why are the core standards listing these things? Uh, the standards emphasize, well, this is me, emphasize use and skillfulness. Not a bunch of skills, but skillfulness. So this is the definition of word study. And uh, you can try to follow along, uh, call out a page if you want. What page are we on? Three. Word study. This is part of that reconceptualizing. When you're teaching spelling, you're also teaching phonics. And when you're teaching spelling, you're also teaching vocabulary. They go together. And one of the nice things is, instructionally, we are saving instructional time. You don't have a separate spelling, a separate phonics program, or a separate vocabulary program. To some extent, you do, but we do want to combine these things. So I will be showing you a classroom pattern in a few minutes. When I'm doing a guided reading group, are they differentiated for you guys? Guided reading groups? For the most part, yes. And why not do your word study during that time? Because that is also differentiated. I'm telling you that if you're a teacher and you have kids who are still learning about short vowels and you try to teach them about long vowels, you're actually doing them harm. We want them to be stable where they're at developmentally. So phonics plus spelling plus vocabulary. Here, I don't think I had this slide. Children and Graham's work recently shows this. Uh, Children learn more about reading from spelling than they do about spelling from reading. The purpose of spelling is to teach reading, doggone it. I I blame Horace Mann. When you go back to the textbooks in the 1840s or earlier, when you bought a reading, when you bought a speller, that was your phonics. It wasn't separate. So now I'd like to combine them going back, and I want to reconceptualize spelling with you a little later. So let's look at the spelling meaning connection. We're trying to work on vocabulary. So let's look at it through spelling. Do your students spell competition that way? Could they? Say competition. comp uh uh comp Now you may say competition or competition. It depends on your dialect. But there's only one way of spelling it, right? These are other ways that they may spell competition. How are you going to help them? Well, in linguistics, it's called syllable stripping. And after spending so many years in Nevada, I don't call it syllable stripping. Uh, (laughs) I call it take apart. (laughs) And that's what I do talk about with my students. Uh, When you look it up linguistically, that's what you'll find. But talk to students about take apart. Take off the suffix, and what do you have? Guys, take off the suffix, and what do you have? You have prefixes, now look at suffixes. Take off T-I-O-N, that's the suffix. What word do you have? That's right, compete. Say compete. It's unambiguous what vowel that is, isn't it? But when you start adding syllables, it messes up the pronunciation of the next to next to last. This is the only dance that I'm doing here. The, the next to next to last. Now, for you guys, that's a fun word. Antepenultimate. Go ahead and say it. Anta. You've got the ultimate. You've got the penultimate. And now you have the antepenultimate. The next to next to last. Let me put it in English. When you add a syllable to a word, it often messes up the pronunciation of the next to next to last syllable. In this case, the compete. Add T-I-O-N, and what do you have? Comp, uh, uh. What vowel is that? That's the upside down, backwards E. It's made right in the middle of your mouth, right? By the way, let's do a little grammar. What part of speech is compete? Good, verb. What part of speech is competition? Uh, What part of speech is decide? Verb. What part of speech is decision? Don't you know that there are thousands of words like that? And we are all hearing that we need to get our frequency up in terms of the number of exemplars that the students are seeing. And so we can do that by playing with words called take apart. So why do we do word study? Because becoming literate depends on the fast, accurate recognition of words in text, fast, accurate production of words in writing, so that they can focus on making meaning. 
Uh, Jack London called it brain energy to think. Word study explicitly teaches students with hands-on activities the vital skills necessary to excel at word recognition, spelling, and vocabulary. So we are explicit. And these, this is all of my, this is, this is the only thing I care about. <laughs> these are the five stages, uh, 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 apart from family uh, and, and you. Uh, but these are the five stages of reading and the five stages of spelling. And there's a synchrony between reading and spelling. And so we can predict what stage of reading you're in by looking at your spelling. And we'll be right more times than you can imagine. More than most standardized tests. Uh, we were hearing about the work in inner city. So um, um, within word pattern students, a third of the kids I was working with in the project uh, in Chicago, 29 middle schools, a third of the students were still here. Let's go through the stages, and you have this somewhere, but here's the emergent stage of reading, here's the emergent stage of spelling. I have better handouts, and I know you almost need a magnifying glass on this. Uh, my website has a, a larger page of this, but let's look. If a child spells float, F-L-O-T, run your finger up, what stage of, of spelling? Letter name alphabetic, what stage of reading? So I bet you, and I'm not a betting person, that if you spell float, F-L-O-T, that you're a word-by-word -word reader, you point to the words as you read, you read aloud when you read it to yourself, you're monotonic, disfluent, staccato-ish in your reading. I don't care what age you are, by the way, because we've done this with adults as well. You are a beginning reader. Let's go over here. If you spell float, F-L-O-W-T, you're in the within word pattern stage, which means that you're looking inside of words at the vowel patterns. And you go up here, these kids are transitional readers. What does that mean? Well, well first of all, those of you who have given birth know that the stage lasts longer than you want. <laughs> and uh, uh, we call it sometimes, I'm a, I'm a remedial person. I, I've spent 30 years working in clinics. Uh, so uh, we call this the black hole of reading. Some kid, a lot of kids get stuck here and they don't climb out. You look at their spelling errors and they're still working on long vowels. This stage is really interesting. It goes from oral silent, Nate the Great, Dinosaur Days, I Can Read Books, all the way to the Treehouse Mysteries, Harold, Horrible Harry, uh, Juna B. Jones. Are you with me? At the beginning of the stage, when children are reading at their instructional level, so does whatever that is, uh, are they reading at oral, silent, or a little bit of both? A little bit of both. When they get to the treehouse, and we can discuss it later if you disagree. If we get to the treehouse mysteries, how are they reading that? Silently. Why do humans read silently? It's a lot more efficient. You can read a lot faster. That's a relatively new development in the history of literacy that we are into silent reading. But these kids, these kids are sort of making their way from oral to silent reading. Uh, Y'all talk about fluency. I'm sorry, I talk about fluency and expression. I separate the two. So these children have a certain amount of ex uh, fluency. So one study uh, had a sentence like this. You stole my frying pan, said Helen Ellen. I read that with expression. But this is how, quote unquote, these children might read it. You stole my frying pan, said Helen Ellen. I got said down by that point. But the children are not reading the words quickly enough to group them into phrases. And that's where the expression, the prosody, is lacking. These children are in the intermediate stage. I get heavy into study skills, some of the things that uh, Doug was talking about. And then we look at kids who say cattle. Cattle, that second syllable in English is often unstressed. Is it C-A-T-T-E-L-L-E, C-A-T-A-L, legal, are you with me? That unstressed vowel is hard. And these are the words that, that the children are working on, two-syllable words. That means, even if you're a second grader and you're working on long vowels, if you don't have short and long vowel, I am wasting your time by spending too much time working on inflected endings. Finally, there's the derivational relation stage. This lasts to, if you're in good health, to age 100. Uh, and I use the word pleasure. Say pleasure. 
You see how it reduced? Ple- eh, eh, eh. Say please. I wonder how old I was when I realized that the word please is in pleasure. Wouldn't that have helped me with my spelling? And maybe I would have dug the meaning a little bit, although it's not very heavy, please, pleasure. These are the stages of development. These are the stages of reading. And there's a certain synchrony between these stages. When I give a spelling inventory in your class, I'll take those spelling inventories and I'll look at the results and I'll divide them into groups. And I'll suggest to you that those might be your reading groups because of that close relationship. Of course you look at anomalies, but it's such a consistent pattern that we want to look at it. We have similar stages in Spanish, but you know that Spanish is very sound outable, isn't it? So the alphabet layer lasts longer in Spanish. And so we have these in Chinese, Korean. Korean is our most phonetic of all languages. So we've been doing this for a little while. And I, I realize that we're working with, a, I'm sort of a remedial reading person having worked in clinics for 30 years. And I think of Frank Vellutino's work. And uh, we all learn how to read in pretty much the same way. But you have to take your time. And you have to look at development. Their error patterns are pretty much the same. And that's why I think we do have RTI is that we have meaningful interventions that follow a developmental sequence. Development is throughout the stages. And these are just some of the groups I work with uh, in, in the Reading Center who confirm for me that even children who have severe language difficulties uh, learn in pretty much the same way. And so we can look at the three layers of all writing systems. Alphabet, pattern, and meaning. And there are these three layers underneath. Phonology, the sound system. Ortho, orthography. Let's do some word study on orthography. Ortho, tell me another word with ortho. Orthodontist makes your teeth straight. And an orthopedic surgeon makes your bones straight. And if you're orthodox, you're pretty straight. (laughs) So this is straight writing. And if you look at it, it means correct writing. These are orthographic patterns. And they're single syllable mostly. And this is morphology. I think it's only mentioned as a term one time in the core standards. But every time you see roots or roots, uh, (laughs) affixes, suffixes, uh, uh, um, roots, uh, they don't use stems. But any time you see these, Uh, They're talking about morphology, and I want to spend some time on that. We talk about 10 principles of word study. Uh, I'm not going to go through all 10. I've written about it for years and years. I like the first one. Turn to a neighbor and say, using but confusing. Go ahead. Now, some of us are already stuck with this. You do that a second time, and you'll be a southerner for two weeks. So watch it. When you're a set, I know you think it's good. Uh, when you're assessing, you're looking for, for what people know. That's their independent level. Then you look for what they're using but confusing. That's the edge of their learning. That's your instructional level. And then you look for frustration level. If a child spells bed, B-D, I'm not working on short vowels. They haven't used them yet. When they spell bed, B-A-D, ah, that's the teachable moment. What they're using but confusing is what I'm looking for. In all of my teaching, I don't care whether it's tennis or whether it's word study. Avoid rules. The time to teach a rule is when the kids already know what you're talking about. You, you could start with a rule, but they have to perceive it, don't they? Don't hide exceptions. I have a, did we order them for, I have a Velcro bear that it pops up every time I say something stupid. And it says, don't say that, don't say that. And like, oh, English spelling is just crazy. You have to memorize it. I'm going to come around and that little bear's going to flop up and say, don't say that. Or if you just say, go look it up, fool. Don't say that to kids. We want to, them to see that it's interesting and that it has a life and that we're not just saying, go look it up. 
So I start often with the spelling inventory. We have a McGraw-Hill spelling inventory as well. And they start from easy to hard. And then, oh, this is a nice one. This is by a Spanish-speaking uh, student. Anyone want to uh, tell me why the child would spell place, P-L-E-I-S? Because they're using their knowledge of Spanish to spell in English. What sound does the E make in Spanish? Okay, good. And what does this I make in Spanish? E. Okay, now, say, I want to I wanna, I wanna spell A. Say A in slow-mo, please, slow motion. A. Again? Y'all didn't realize it until just now, but it is a what? Two, two, two vowels in one. It's a what? It's a diphthong vowel. So is I. Say I. I. Two, two. So that's what Spanish speakers will do. They are more sensitive to the vowels than Anglo. And so say place with the, the Spanish vowels. A, A. Are you with me? And so invented spellings are interestingly correct. And so if you're a Korean speaking child, I want to look at what errors you're making so that I can attend to them. There are no S blends in Spanish. There's no SHs in Spanish. There are hardly consonant blends and digraphs in Arabic. What are you going to do? You need to point those things out. And that's the fun of word study. And so we have a checklist. And the first place where the child misses two or more is where you begin instruction. Digraphs and blends, and that's the stage the child is in. First place where they miss more than uh, two or more. Short vowels, middle letter name. This is my grouping for word study and reading. This is a third grade classroom. I wanted three groups, and I got them with the word study, and we're going to try those out as reading groups. We just completed a study. You don't have this. It hasn't been published yet, but we are looking at a validation uh, of an uh, observation guide. And we did a little study that went with it. Student talk was one of the biggest factors as to whether you were having an effective classroom. Remind you of Doug's talk today? Automaticity and vocabulary development. Student reflection. The teacher helps the students develop and articulate hypotheses. What I find is that teachers do a word study for a week and say, okay, let's go to the next one. And we have word study for every spelling week in, the, in our program. But some days you may want to spend four days, three days, and some you want to spend two weeks. So it's up to the teacher to make some of these decisions. So all students have a word study notebook. I prefer the three um, brads or the one and a half inch spiral, so you can uh, uh, br um, three rings, so you can put paper in. Some of us like spirals because they're so cheap. And that's where they write their word sorts. That's where they write their word hunts. And word hunts is one of the most popular and easiest of all activities. Go find words that sound like and look like decide or decision. Here's a child sorting TH pictures and CH, and then he's writing the words in his spiral notebook. And then here's a, first, a kindergartner sorting H's and S's with an aid, playing board games. Don't kids like to play like teacher? This is a word hunt, short A, long A. This is a sixth grader writing his sort into his word study notebook. This is a fourth grade teacher working on what? No change, doublet, e-drop. And look on the table in, in front. They've already done the sort, and now they're talking about it. It's that talk part that I don't see teachers doing that I need to go in and unpack. Just take a piece of chart paper, for goodness sakes, and open it up and tell me other words that look like and sound like hopping in the middle. Kids, don't the kids like to chart? We can work on grammar at the same time. Let me spend a moment on word study lesson plan or format and organization. I felt like, my joke is I felt like Madeline Hunter when I made this up. You demonstrate the sort, you sort and check, you reflect the yik-yak that I want from students, and then you extend. Let me show you a friend of mine who was teaching a 
fifth and sixth grade classroom, and then I'll show a video. By the way, it's that extend part that you really had to spend a lot of time on. Every day they're going to be involved in word study. I may only spend five minutes, three minutes on a focused lesson, but they are going to be doing word sorting at their circle with me, at their seat work, and at their centers. So here's a fifth, sixth grade teacher, and she's saying, hey, we could spell illegal that way. We could spell immature, and golly, I'm not going to ask you, maybe you'll tell me at dinner, but I don't think you all know this. You know it in your soulness, and that's what's intimidating about some of this word study at the upper levels, but you haven't thought about it enough at a conscious level to know about assimilated prefixes. And so she's having the kids do their sort. Why do some words have I am, I L, I R? Do y'all know this one? Let's try it out. Say in legal, not legal. Are you with me? Say it five times. In legal. In, it doesn't feel right. The I N literally turned into what? I L. Look at the I R. Say irresponsible. It doesn't feel right. The I-N turned into what? I-R. Do you see how we're working on spelling and meaning at the same time? And meaning would be vocabulary. And this is called assimilated prefixes. And there are thousands of words like this. So the children are sorting. They're talking about it. They're looking in their root books. Talking about it some more writing it in their word study notebook, extending it, and here's a lesson. I mean, I'm sorry, a, a game. So now let's go to a fourth grade teacher. And I'm going to speed up parts so don't get dizzy on me. But listen, she knows what she's teaching. Listen to her talk. Um, and different kinds of long vowel patterns. So we have already talked about um, short CBC. And we've also talked about long C, B, C, E. And we've just introduced um, short, uh, long vowel pattern C, B, B, C. So we'll be looking at the long A pattern A, I, and A, Y, along with um, long C, B, C, E, and short A. And we use those terms with the children. We have a new sort to start this week. And before we go through and talk about the pattern, let's, let's read the word and see um, if we can read these words and if we know what they mean. What word is this? Green. Green. Like whole grain. What about this word? Grain. I raised you. I raised you. Raise can also mean to lift something up. My dad used to do raises. He used to do raises when he was working out. Okay, I want you to take a look at these words and the patterns that you see in this word. What do you notice about these words? Melana, what do you notice? Some of them have AI. Some of them have AI in the middle. Some have just an A. What else do you notice? Um, Mauricio, do you notice anything? Good. Now, if I just want to break these up into columns, how can I sort these words? Mauricio, what do you think? Like the AYs? Okay, let's move the AYs into a column. Okay. Using the words that are left, can I sort any of those words into another pile? Yeah. What do you see in this word? AI, okay. Let's put some AI. What sound does AI make? A. A, long A sound. What about AY? What sound? Because we put these in AY. A, a long A too. Okay, any other piles? The C, B, C, E. What does C, B, C, E stand for? Yes, consonant vowel, consonant E. Let's put in consonant vowel, consonant E in. Okay, look at our words that are left. Anything alike that these could go in a pile? Mm -hmm. CBC. Consonant mm -hmm. vowel consonant. Well, that's a, that's this a, says this, is an odd this might be an oddball. How come? Because it's uh, gay and then and there's an A and then the side of the C E. And it starts with an E. Okay, so let's put that in an oddball pile. I'm going to speed up. up. Now um, um, I gave you a toolkit uh, these are all on the PD toolkit, and you can watch them and show them to your students. And I'll be glad to come back to that later. So she's demonstrating the sort. 
Now the children are practicing it, and she gets to look in and visit with the children. And now they're checking their work. How about our long A um, C V V C pile? Kale and passion. Want to check that one? Green. We do a lot of partner work. I'm going to move on, please. And so. Um, v V, which is the. If, let's see if we can. V V V, which is the A Y. And we have one oddball. They. They. Why is they an oddball? Let's talk about they. And so she's going to have them work on this sort all week long. You need to put your name on the top, and you can put it in your word saying notebook for tomorrow. Okay? okay. And so they, there are all kinds of ways of doing this. For me, on Monday, I have the children do what she just had them do. And so we just they looked. At, now I'd like to go through the stages very quickly. The emergent stage. This is what we are calling our literacy diet. And particularly the part at the bottom, concept of word in text. And this is in that new book. And so these are the five, six things that I'm going to work on. And so we have our two-fisted simian grip head start kid. <laughs> and we have our emergent behaviors. And so my teacher called this the miracle of reading. And we have three phases. And why do I think this is important? Uh, reading recovery might call it one-to-one uh, um, um, -one correspondence. It's a little more detailed than that. We know that the children who cannot do this, Sam, Sam, the baker man, are not ready for a formal phonics program, will not learn sight words with any ease. Here's what they do. Sam, Sam, the baker man. Now, we have known this since Jesus learned to read. Uh, we've known this in chapter 2 of To Kill a Mockingbird, and I'll show you that in a minute. Washed his face in a frying. In China, the children get it one year earlier at four years of age because every character is a single syllable. Here's a child, one, two, buckle my shoe, and she did it this way. One, two, buckle my. You see, we don't talk in words. We talk in phrases, breath groups, speech envelopes. And so we can do it in Spanish. Don't wait until they know English, for goodness sakes. Get going. Here's a child who definitely uh, has a history of learning difficulties. He's repeating first grade, and he's still learning to point. And yes, I could not remember. And so Scout's sitting, uh, sitting by herself in her classroom. And Ms. Caroline Fisher said, how did you learn to read? And she said, my father taught me. She said, your father does not know how to teach. You can have a seat now, and I'll try to undo the damage from here. Chapter 2, To Killing Mockabur. And it goes like this. I could not remember when the lines above Atticus's moving finger separated into words. That's concept of word. And if, if a child can't point accurately, then that child doesn't have a cow, C-O-W, concept of word. And don't expect them to learn a bunch of sight words, and don't expect them to learn a lot of phonics so that they can do anything with. You may be in the Edmark series and learn 50 sight words, but you may also may not be able to do hoot with it either. No offense, Edmark. So we do concept sorts. We get them thinking, categorizing, talking about how they categorize things. We have them sorting at their seats, primary colors, junk food, healthy food, animals I like, animals in the water, uppercase, lowercase, my name. This child, you can tell, lived in Nevada too long. She needed three spinners. And this is just a letter sort, letter spin. You spin, find the letter, move it over to here. And these are the games that I'll introduce as a teacher and that they will play on their own just like they were at a listening center. They'll be doing button sorts, animal sorts. They're reading together. They're talking together. They have these little cards that they hold up in response. They look for sight words together. I told you I was going to go fast. We do writing together. These are kindergarten and first grade classrooms. I write my name, and look at this kid. He's really working on his name, isn't he? 
He's got a long name. And we always have reasons for the kids to write, I am next. I want to play at the center. Get out of here. I'm next. I want to cash in. But I also may be doing a sort at my seat with my partner. That kid's thinking. I may also buy some flowers. And this is how these children spell at this point. Fan, pet, dig, rob, hope, when. And they're sorting by initial consonant. And this is their test for the week in, for, in kindergarten. Bed, five, batter. Some more writing. Every day, reading and doing word study with their children. And so here's Ms. Smith. This is her whole class activity. But then, and she's doing five lines from A Hunting We Will Go. And you have this in your handout. And so here's her morning schedule and afternoon. And notice that she's working on concept of word. I'm just going to go through these, I think. Uh, we'll look for Vicki to spell it out. But let me spend a moment here. Circle, seat, center. I think of three areas of the room. If you want to do four, great. If you want to do six, great. We'll get a couple of people to push in, too. I have trouble managing six. I'm pretty good at three. Circle is my religious time with my small group. That's when I do my read, read with and my word study. Center and seat work. We call it station in our wonders program. And then I have an evaluation and break period. They've got to take responsibility. And so during evaluation and break, I ask these questions. These questions are about 40 years old. Did you finish your work? You just got through with that center. Did you finish your work? I'm not talking to you to spill on someone else. I'm looking at you. Did you do the best you could? Now, maybe you didn't finish your work because it's my problem. Maybe I gave you too much to do. And finally, what did you do when you were through? I'm working with my circle group. I've got to make sure that you've got things to do yourself. Here's a friend of mine in first grade who did a four group. So she was quite the artist, so she had a creation area. Michelangelo did not do a great painting in one session. So you have to have room for kids to come back to their paintings. When I'm done, you're always trying to get them to figure out what to do when they're done, because you're never done. That's the fun part of being a writer. And these are the weekly schedules that you'll see in your handout. And if you go online, you'll hear these teachers talking about these schedules. Partner work, game day, record your sort. I'll show you some of these. So here's a teacher working in small group, and they're doing a BMRS. This is a teacher who, she had six groups, but she also had two push-ins. These are just schedules that you can see. She had three teachers. How do you greet each other in the morning? How do you pay attention? What's our morning routine? And you have these as handouts. Kids get into the box to get their math activity sometimes. The teacher has a notebook for every child. And they have responsibilities. And rules for independent reading. What to do to read to yourself. This is some of that vocabulary that I'm going to get into now. But what does it mean to be having a birthday? What are some of the phrases and words you want to use? Or they were studying goods and services. This is some of the domain specific. What do I know about goods? What do I know about services? They did a brainstorming on snowboarding. And this is their story together. Don't you love it in classrooms where they have a lot of these charts hanging around? with ditties and rhymes that you can go, and I want this one. I do something called personal readers. It's basically the language experience with a new name. So there's a personal reader. Children read in their personal readers every day. So you can take a poem from our program, type it in. It's mixed up with plenty of books. Ladybug, ladybug, how are you today? We try to see if we can get them reading a lot. Eyes on the page, five little pumpkins. Oh, this is my crackers and crumbs. Do you all know this one? 
Crackers and crumbs, crackers and crumbs. These are my fingers, these are my thumbs. These are my eyes, these are my ears. They'll all grow big in the next 10 years. This is just a PowerPoint, you could set it up as a center, but we could also type it up in 28 point, and that child's gonna reread this puppy. So here are some children. I'm walking around singing, cats for sale, cat, y'all know that story? And so here it is, typed up. And that child read it, every time she read it, she put a little tick mark. And you can see she invented a base four counting system. <laughs> but don't you know, the more times you read these words, the more they will stick. Here's some partner reading, you might call that pals if you wish. This is a bilingual personal reader, El Raton, the rat. But that's a picture of a cat, isn't it? Uh, Here's a, here's a kindergarten teacher working with the kids on the floor with a picture sort, and now they're reading together. I love to ride. That's the kind of close work we want. I'm just going through because I really want to get to the upper levels. <laughs> this is enough at the lower levels, isn't it? There's a nice word study notebook. Children sorting and reading and word study at their seats. That's that game. Now we're up to that transitional stage. They are using but confusing long vowel patterns. And these are the things they're working on. There's a lot to work on here. So let me show you some of that. The, the I can read books. Notice how the sentences are getting longer. And we're writing more. See how we're looking at long vowels? Long vowel patterns. They love playing games. The racetrack game is one of the most popular. So here's a teacher. She's showing the kids long O, long A. And then they're going to go in here and bust it up because we've sort by sound and then by sight. Sound and then sight. And then they're playing the racetrack game. And there are three copies. One, two, three. So as a literacy leader, I sometimes come in with templates for us to make games in our PLC. So we chart. Don't kids like playing Jeopardy? You bet. Don't they like playing teacher? And this is at the end of that stage. If they have this, they're pretty much through with single syllable words. And you can see, why do some words have O-Y and other words have O-I? Again, you know it in your soulness, but putting it out here, it really allows you to reflect on it. And when you look down here, it said, I saw that O-Y were always at the end, and O-Y never, something like that. O-Y is at the end, isn't it? And O-I is what? In the middle. Here, this is, isn't this better than a bad-mannered spelling test? Do you write this down from the whiteboard? I call out the word paint. Where would you put the word paint? and you write that down, and this is something similar. So these are the games and activities that we try to teach to our students in our programs. Now let me quickly talk about spelling. Spelling's a part of literacy instruction. I've already said that, and you have this as a handout, so may I go faster? So I want to reconceptualize the role of spelling in our teaching. First of all, you start out on Monday. They should spell 40 to 50% of the words correctly, and they can check each other th their own work. At least I, that's what I have my students do. And the funny thing is you're looking for 90% accuracy. I'm not looking for an A from you, a B from you, a, a normal curve or something. I'm looking for 90% from each of you on your particular words. That's why we have three lists for every list. I have a hard list, a medium list, uh, Struggling list, if you will, or approaching. And to get 90% means that you're going to generalize. That's the name of the game. Don't you hear people complain? I learned the spelling words today, but what? You can hear that generation after generation. So they need to explain their sort. Why did you sort the way you did? They need to be able to talk about it. And the parents are going to say, hey, Bear, the, 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 they're too easy. And I'm going to say, look, we want transfer to writing. 
And that's going to be part of your grading. If you turn in second draft writing and we've worked on long vowels, I'm going to expect you to spell long vowels, and that's going to be in our word study contract for the week. I have them sorted at home. P parents of uh, English learner parents uh, uh, like these sorts to go home, and they often ask for others for themselves. And we've known since 1919 that writing the words 10 times is not what we want to do. So here's Ms. Flores. We just watched her do this sort. And you would see in the sort online, you'd see the games. You could see her structure of her. These are three spelling inventories over the course of the year. And you could see the kids' progress. This is a different discussion that I'd love to have with you in the afternoons. Add, she did this with the district. I would cross this out. We're doing too much of this. Add your words into your sight word dictionary. So the, di the district was giving out sight words, and you had to write them in your dictionary as if that was the best way to teach sight words. We'll talk about that someday. But Tuesday through Friday, I can live with. The fr f Wednesday was interesting. She had the kids sort the words five times and then explain it to a friend. And I said, golly, Michelle, that's a lot. But I watched it, and I, I could do three, but five worked out great, too. This is how she assigned centers. That's one of the centers, a contraction center. This is Ms. Wazner up in St. Paul. She's working with Hmong and Somali children, or speaking those languages. So she teaches a poem with word study in it. And there she is. A lot of the vowels aren't the same. Hmong has different vowels than English. So they're working on the vowels of English as well as the meaning of these words. And they're working together, sorting. And they're explaining their sorts to each other. This is a second grade teacher. Two-thirds of her kids were at the same developmental level. And so she's doing a two-thirds class intro on this lesson. And it's our control. But then she busts them up. How can I get my hands on you if I got you in a group of 15 kids? So I like eight, eight, and eight, something like that. And that's what you'll see here. One-third here, one-third at their seats, and one-third around the room. So you see one-third of the kids right here at their pod sorting. And here's a child sorting, writing it into her word study notebook. Oh, and that's me on the left cheating just as much as I can. But we don't call it cheating. We call it what? Working together. If your floor is clean enough, we have sorts on the floor. Sheep in a Jeep by Ruth Heller. Isn't that a great book? Makes a great word study game. And these kids made up their own football game. Don't they like Jeopardy? Sorry, there's a nice word study notebook. And this child has written a reflection. Now, I didn't know that long I was masculine until this day. I that says his name. And all she did was write the sort into her notebook, and then she explained her sort. This word say I by the E at the end. Are you with me? I'm moving on, though. This is a homophone rummy. Don't they love that? This is a fourth grade teacher in St. Paul, and she's working on R controlled. And that's her four day sequence in a pullout. And you have this in your handout. And there's a word study notebook grading form. And I will change it for the grade. But I'm not just grading your spelling, I'm grading your entry into your word study notebook. I'm looking at your writing, I'm looking at your elaboration in talking about your, the word study. Oh, goodness, I, how much time do I have? Only a couple hours? Ready? <laughs> so now we're up to... How, I'm past time. Can you give me five minutes? All right, here we go. Speed viewing. <laughs> I like generative morphology. We've already heard about it a little bit this, uh, today in the uh, fusion program. Um, and so when we learn one word, we learn 10. When you learn one word, you're learning exponentially. When you go to onelook.com, my students and I were looking at S-Y-N, and it only gave me the first thousand uh, on another slide. And th these are S -Y uh, then there were S-Y-Ms. There were 700 of those. S-Y-N means with. S-Y-M means with. S-Y-L means with. And there are thousands of words like that. That's the generative aspect. And when you go to onelook.com and get this page on, all of these are hot links that will take you to 20 dictionaries. 
And this is what uh, uh, Doug reminded me of this today. My, my, my students don't hear anybody talking about words the way I talk about them. And so they're grateful for it. No, they say, no one ever talked to me about words the way you did. And so this is an opportunity to help think people think because vocabulary makes you smarter. This is that fourth stage. I'm going quickly at this point. We hear some of the research that we know that morphology helps your reading. Over 80% of the words in the content areas are Greek and Latin origin. And so don't just study one word. Look at all the words you have here. And so here are some of the strategies. Playing games on the floor. We, we've, we'll get through these. But I want to get into some complex ideas with you. So we're looking at domain vocabulary, generative vocabulary, and academic uh, vocabulary. So here's general. This is the Coxhead list, a part of it. These, you, you all know this, don't you? These words exist in all content areas. I want to teach the word analyze. So why don't I play with it? Don't just start with one. Look at all those exemplars that you have in front of you. Look at variety or vary. 11% of the words in here are general academic vocabulary words. Another thing from the core standards is vocabulary is embedded in phrases. Problem is, dilemma, for example. This is, this is a nice uh, website, Norbert Schmidt. Do you all know his work? Norbert Schmidt. He's, he's, he's Engl uh, American, but he's lived in England quite some time now. And he talks about formulaic language. And he helps me think about teaching in phrases. Look at the word successive. Each successive. Successive generations. Are you with me? And then we have terms like in terms of, at the same time. Don't teach one word. Teach in phrases. Isn't that nice? And so this is part of that general. And when I go to onelook.com, I was looking at courage with my students, and I found 122 phrases that just came up with the word courage. And that helps you to think about the vocabulary as opposed to just, oh, write two sentences. I don't know that the research supports that. And now we're into domain-specific. I love DEC. What does DEC mean? Ten. And we're trying to get English teachers to work with content teachers, aren't we? What's your, what's your domain-specific vocabulary? And if you're a fifth grader, aren't you going to love the word decimate? You all know the word decimate? You did a lousy job of fighting today, and so I have someone else line you up, and I have someone else kill every tenth soldier <laughs> just to make sure that next time we fight, you, you put a little more sincerity into it. D-E-C. Decade. Ten. Decimate. And so we can play these... Uh, we can put, have a lot of play with all of these words in a generative sort of sense. D-I-C, to say, to talk. It just goes on. Look at that great vocabulary that we can unpack. And we know that there are ten to 15,000 words in Spanish that match English, that are cognates. I'm not going to show this. I'll let you see it online. This is Ms. Bruscotter, and she's doing a whole class lesson on prefixes and suffixes. But she's also doing a small group lesson on open and closed syllables. Some of the kids in her class were only able to really work with long vowels in terms of a short, focused lesson. They could learn about prefixes and suffixes in terms of vocabulary, but not in terms of deep word study. And that's what she differentiates. And she has rules for, or this is her schedule for weekly word study, and you have that, and it's also online. And these are some of the rules that they came up with as a group. So they did this type of word study online, uh, uh, on, on a smart board as a whole class. And they, she did it orally because a lot of these kids can't read these words. So we have L-Y, E-R, but we're also at Ibble Able, which is something that you and I could work on. This is a sixth grade teacher, I'll go by him, but he's doing the similar sort of thing. He's meeting with a small group. Kids are at their seat. 
and playing games, different class. These are some of their work that they'll do. Why do some words end in L-E and other words E-L? Here's a teacher sorting, doing concept sorts. These are very popular these days. So for example, here's one on stars and planets. I was working with a group in LA and I just took the, the words from the book and then we sorted them into American and British concept sorts. Here's a concept sort in science. Elements, compounds, mixtures. We do power maps. Fungi, plantae, animalia. And these are all in our work. And these are just activities for you to use at the upper level for vocabulary. Almost done. Mythology. I'm not teaching religion, I'm sorry, biblical illusions. I'm not teaching the Bible. But this does help your comprehension to have a sense of these biblical illusions. Or let's take mythology. You got Atlas. You've got Cronus, Saturn, meaning time. Father Time always has a beard because you didn't see him that often. Nemesis. I love Tantalus. Y'all know Tantalus? He tried to feed the gods one of his children, and that's not so cool. That's called cannibalism. And they didn't want anything with it. And so they put him in a, in a, in a, a little uh, cave, and he'd try to reach for some water. It'd all run away. He'd reach for an apple on a branch, and the branch would push away. And that's called being what? Tantalized. So look at all these words that come from mythology. So I'm looking at generative morphological vocabulary instruction. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Can we generate related words? You'll see a seventh grade teacher doing word study, playing Jeopardy. I did this with kids. I had no idea I was going to learn about volo that day, meaning to wish. And so you need to have word study resources like this Hode book that you can buy used. Or I was studying uh, Guy Fawkes Day, and we looked at the bonfire. Bonfire used to mean bone fire, or it still means it, but that's how it was spelled. And these are some of the websites that you have in your handout that I would definitely make use of. See, there are a thousand S-Y-N words, all meaning with. So these are the types of activities that I'll do with older students. This is the type of schedule that I'll have, some must-dos and some optionals, some choices. And you have this in your handout. Profess profession, verb, noun, verb, noun. Monday, I'll introduce the vocabulary. Tuesday, we'll use it. And so I'm not interested in everybody doing deep word study on all 20 words. They may only do three words, but everybody else shares. And so these kids were in fifth and sixth grade. We're looking at T-A-I-N. Did you know that that meant to hold when you see it at the end of a word? It's our most common root, T-E-N, to hold. Like even the word tent is stretched cloth. If you pretend you're holding forth, if you're tense, you're a little stretched, aren't you? And what does a tendon do? Stretches. And these are fifth and sixth graders. How come I had to wait until I was, well, last year, 39? Isn't that pretty? But it also has some thinking. And this is about the end. This is my summer, summertime armpit sort. <laughs> it gets hot down there, but it's good work. So thank you for being with me. Thank you for letting me go on longer. And I wish you happy word study.